Over half the towns in New England were attacked in King Philip's War with a staggering percent of fatalities. Yet you might not have ever heard of this war. I'm Professor Tom Arby. Welcome to this edition of United States History Online. Today, I'm talking about King Philip's War, which took place primarily in the Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut colonies between 1675 and 1676. Most students know very little about this war. If mentioned at all, most high school and college history textbooks give King Philip's War no more than a perfunctory sentence or two. Why do historians gloss over this war? In proportion to the population in 17th century New England, King Philip's War inflicted greater casualties than any other war in American history. But I want you to consider this. When a historian decides to write a history of the United States, he or she is faced with an overwhelming number of persons, places, and events to include or exclude. The process of choosing requires the author to determine what's important, what's essential, and also what's marginal. King Philip's War always falls in the margin category. But why? Here's the brief story of this war. The Poconoke chief or Grand Sachem, Massasoit, represented, among others, the bands of the American Indians known today as Wampanoags, Nipmucks, Pocomtucks, and Narragansetts. Massasoit played a key role in saving the pilgrims from total starvation in the first winter the pilgrims spent in the New World. As a result, a warm relationship developed between the pilgrims and the Indians under Massasoit's leadership. Unfortunately, as a new generation of pilgrims and Massachusetts Bay Puritans populated the region, many white settlers infringed on tribal lands and unfairly dominated trade with the Native Americans. With Massasoit's death, his eldest son, Wamsuta, became Grand Sachem, and the relationship between the English and the natives began to deteriorate. At some point, Wamsuta sold a parcel of land to Roger Williams of Rhode Island, and according to the governor of Plymouth Colony, Josiah Winslow, Wamsuta's action violated the law. So Winslow ordered the arrest of Wamsuta. Shortly after his capture, Wamsuta died. The settlers never determined the cause of death. But Wamsuta's younger brother, Medicom, believed the settlers had poisoned his brother. So anger consumed Medicom. The English abuse had gone too far. And Medicom decided to take revenge. Now, at the time, John Sassamon, a Native American who had converted to Christianity, and he was called, by the way, the settlers called him a praying Indian. Sassamon spoke both English and the various languages of the Algonquin Indians. John Sassamon had grown close to many settlers, and he most likely tipped off the Puritans to the time and place of Medicom's planned revenge attack. 
Medicom discovered that the settlers had gotten wind of his plan, so he called off the attack. But several months later, the English found Sassamon's body floating in the nearby Assawampit River. The Puritan settlers immediately arrested three Indians for the murder. Within days, they had tried and executed two of them. Medicom again concluded that the Indians defend themselves by driving the English back into the Atlantic. And thus the war began. The Puritans referred to Medicom as Philip. They believed Medicom should go by the name of an ancient leader of Macedonia, a pagan, who was, quote, desperate for the light of the gospel, end quote. Thus, we have King Philip's War. King Philip's War spared no brutality. The Puritans enjoyed an advantage in weapons, and they finally tracked down King Philip in the area of what is now Mount Hope, Rhode Island. They killed and beheaded King Philip in keeping with the brutality the settlers had endured and had meted out. And the king's head remained on a pike on display just outside of Boston for several years a reminder to all Native Americans that they would either submit or die. Following the war, the surviving followers of King Philip faced servitude, disease, cultural disruption, and the expropriation of their land at the hands of the Puritans. A Puritan religious leader named Increase Mather wrote a book entitled, A Brief History of the War with the Indians in New England. And he wrote this soon after King Philip's War ended. Mather argued, and everyone agreed with him, that the Puritans' victory demonstrated God's favor on the New World settlers. A few months later, William Hubbard wrote another book, narrative of the troubles with the Indians in New England. And he described the Indians' con conduct as barbarous and inhumane. And for this reason, he believed King Philip's war was criminal and did not deserve the title war. So I want to ask you several questions. What do you think the Indians would have called the war? Maybe the Puritan conquest or Metacom's rebellion. In describing what happened and why it happened, whose voices have we heard? Whose voices remain silent. Why do you suppose most historians exclude this tragic event from their books? I mean, the Puritans virtually annihilated the Native American population of New England at the time. Isn't that consequence of some historical importance? Consider what historian Jill Lepore said about King Philip's War. If war is, at least in part, a contest for meaning, can it ever be a fair fight when only one side has access to these perfect instruments of empire? Pens, papers, and printing presses.